Who controls the past, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, May 28th, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, why the elites want more social disorder. Then, what's the end game for armed robotics? And the military ships anthrax to nine states. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. There's no question that the elite want to establish control over everything in the entire world. The question is, how will they do it? Will it be an economic collapse? Will it be a massive pandemic? Will it be a rise of killer robots that cannot be controlled? Tonight, we're going to look at why the elite want to create more social disorder. This is an article from Paul Joseph Watson. He says authoritarianism needs to be rebranded in the minds of the public, and we're going to see so does the value of human life. We're going to cover that next. But first, he says this about what's coming this summer. He says 96% of Americans believe the U.S. will witness more Baltimore-style riots this summer. The elites know the riots are coming because, to a large extent, their policies have created the environment for them. That would be wealth inequality, which has proven to cause social unrest is at its worst since before World War II. Wealth inequality, he points out, isn't caused by a failure of capitalism, it's caused by catastrophic Keynesian central bank policies that have instituted endless money printing and worldwide inflation. And as we pointed out earlier in this week, we have uh, reports from HSBC as well as from uh, Goldman Sachs saying this is something that is going to result in a kind of titanic sinking of the economy. And there's no lifeboats because we don't have any more to give in terms of economic manipulation. The tools of Keynesianism have come to the end of the line. They were basically a false high. They've been sustaining the world economy for a very long time, and the crash is going to be very hard when we come back to reality. He goes on to point out that with religion, family, and social mobility all declining in influence, lifestyles built around the acquisition of products will become harder to maintain as the economic environment worsens. In other words, if you're going to define your life by your material gain, by what you have, that the guy with the most toys uh, wins when he dies, that's going to come down to a very empty, shallow future for many people because that cannot be sustained any longer. Now, what's happening, as he points out, is a massive awakening, mainly because of free speech and the Internet. In efforts to pull this down, the elite are doing everything they can to divide and conquer us and to accelerate this decline. Whatever the mechanism, they're looking to create wars, they're looking for economic collapse. They see this thing on the horizon, and of course, they are the ones who are causing it. We need to understand, as they try to divide us into a kind of tribalism, they're using language that is geared towards heightening racism, not taking it down. They're also talking about speciesism. What's behind this? This is all about devaluing us as individual humans. This is something that's been going on for a very long time. There's a trial that's going on today in New York, uh, it started yesterday, looking at the human rights of a couple of chimpanzees at Stony Brook University in New York. Now, in the coverage of this trial, there were three op-ed pieces in Wired Magazine yesterday talking about the necessity of treating chimpanzees as humans, giving them human rights, never mind that humans are having their rights stripped from them at an increasing rate across the board. No. We have to give human rights to chimpanzees. I'm all for treating animals humanely. I think it's very important that we not treat animals in an inhumane way. One of the characteristics of serial killers is that they tortured animals, usually as a child. So it's very important to have compassionate uh, treatment of other creatures. Nevertheless, they are not human. What is behind this? This speciesism that Peter Singer talks about. This is about creating a kind of self-loathing for the entire human race. They have to have a devaluation of human life, just as Hitler needed to talk about the Auslander, 
the foreigner, the Jew within their midst before they began World War II. They had to have an enemy. They had to devalue human life. We see that coming at us today. Look at this story. This is coming from uh, New York. This is Stony Brook University. On April 20th, Justice Barbara Jaffe of the Manhattan Supreme Court created quite a stir when she put out an order to show cause and a writ of habeas corpus. It went through the press. Look, a judge has recognized human rights of chimpanzees. She quickly took that out and removed the writ of habeas corpus from that. Now they had a trial that began yesterday, another hearing. They say the order does, what the order does is to require the university to show cause for holding the chimpanzees. They argue that chimpanzees are legal persons with a right to bodily liberty. Bodily liberty, think about that. You and I are having our liberties removed constantly. We're being treated like inventory, like cattle on the streets of our cities when we travel at the airports. Nevertheless, we're going to elevate chimpanzees. It's not about elevating the treatment of animals as much as it is about destroying the value of human life. Now, Peter Singer points out that in 1993, he and uh, Cavallari founded the Great Ape Project, an organization that he says was intended to gain for our fellow great apes the rights to life, liberty, and protection from torture. We can't even get protection from torture for people that the CIA targets. How about doing some things for humans before we start uh, on this speciesism? And he says the purpose of this project, the Great Ape Project, was to include apes within what he called the community of equals. That is, the community of those as recognized as having basic rights. Well, that sounds very noble, doesn't it? Until you understand who Peter Singer really is. He's a so-called ethicist uh, of an Ivy League school, and there's a tracing of his past comments about human beings on the site ERLB, looking at ethics from a religious standpoint. And they point out that there's been a long progression. If we go back to Charles Darwin, who came up with the theory of evolution, look at his cousin Francis Galton, who essentially applied that to a new field, where he coined the term eugenics. Then from there, we go to the Scopes trials, where Clarence Darrow says, we need to chloroform unfit children, he said after the, that's not part of the Scopes trial, but he is on record as saying, chloroform the unfit children, show them the same mercy that is shown to beasts that are no longer fit to live. Then, of course, we had Margaret Sanger, who created Planned Parenthood, expressly for the purpose of eugenics, to extinguish people that she thought of as animals, people that she did not think of as equals. That kind of elitist eugenicism that took place and is still there at Planned Parenthood. That's why we had the, uh, the demonstration that all black lives matter at the Planned Parenthood Center in Austin last week. But let's go from Margaret Sanger to Peter Singer, who is still writing op-ed pieces, talking about uh, human beings. This is what he had to say about children who suffered with Down syndrome. He says, the quality of life of someone with Down syndrome is below the standard at which medical treatment to sustain the life of an infant becomes obligatory. In other words, we have no obligation to save the life of a child with Down syndrome. He gives his justification for it. He says, they are not able to play the guitar. They'll never be able to do that. They'll never develop an appreciation of science fiction. They'll never learn a foreign language or chat about the latest Woody Allen movie or be a respectable athlete, basketball player, or tennis player. That's his ethics. This is the guy who says that we need to be humane in our treatment of apes. We need to let them out of the confinement that they're in at Stony Brook University in New York. That's not about that. It's about devaluing human life. It's about treating us worse than we treat animals. It's about telling people that humans are just other animals, and by the way, they are the ones who are destroying the planet. That's the next part of it. So we need to have something that destroys all the humans. We've seen that from some people developing, capable of developing bioweapons, speaking right here in Austin. There's another thing that, and we're going to talk about bioweapons and uh, the latest release, the latest sloppy work, if you want to believe that it's sloppy. Uh, perhaps it's just cavalier carelessness, but maybe there's more to it. We're going to talk about that in the next segment. But right now, I want to talk about how these same people who are holding up apes to us and saying that we need to give them rights, it's the same crowd that is also saying the same thing about robots. At the same time, we see that robots 
are being given the ability to kill indiscriminately to make that decision against humans. They're telling us that we need to think about robots, especially those who become self-aware. They're preparing us for this in all the movies, whether it's Ex Machina, whether it's Chappie. We see these directors as they're promoting their recent movies, telling us that we need to be prepared to accept them as co-equals. Perhaps many of them will say superior to us. And you see that in their movies, that they truly are not only intellectually and physically superior to humans, but they show them as being ethically superior to humans. This is all preparing us to devalue and cheapen human life so they can wipe it out on a grand, unprecedented scale. Now, there were a series of articles that were done in Nature magazine. Uh, Drudge picked up one of them today from Stuart Russell. His op-ed piece was, we need to take a stand on AI weapons. And he talks about the ethics of artificial intelligence. There are other op-ed pieces there as well. And this gives you kind of an idea of the scope of the debate. Some say shape the debate, don't shy from it. Another one says we need to distribute the benefits of AI fairly. That's your uh, socialist approach to <laughs> the uh, Terminator, the rise of the robots. And then we have one, embrace a robot in human world. Yes, they're just cuddly little uh, uh, toys that we can play with. But Stuart Russell gets right to the point, and he makes a very interesting revelation. He talks about the development of lethal autonomous weapon systems, L-A-W-S. That's Pentagon talk, okay? And they're talking about laws. Don't worry about martial law so much as you worry about lethal autonomous weapon systems. That's what they're creating right now. That is way beyond martial law. Turn these autonomous systems loose. Give them the power and the decision-making capability of destroying humans on a grand scale and then just sit back and watch it happen. You can always say that it was just a software glitch. We really didn't mean for that to happen. This is how we understand the difference between autonomous weapon systems and those that aren't, those that are just, uh, that are controlled uh, remotely. He says autonomous weapon systems select and engage targets without human intervention. They become lethal when those targets become humans. Laws, lethal autonomous weapon systems, might include, for example, armed quadcopters that can search for and eliminate enemy combatants in a city, but do not include things like cruise missiles or remotely piloted drones for which humans are still making targeting decisions. And he points out, of course, that this is coming from DARPA, the usual suspect, the people who are involved in defense advanced research projects. They have something else that they're working on. Sounds very much like laws. It's called code. Collaborative operations in a denied environment. And of course, this is another justification for giving killing power to your machines and then just turning them loose in a given area. They say code aims to develop teams of autonomous aerial vehicles carrying out, quote, all steps of a strike mission to find, fix, track, target, engage, assess in situations, they say, in which enemy signal jamming makes communication with a human commander impossible. Oh, really? So that's why they have to have them there, because they're not going to be able to control these things from a distance. If there's signal jamming going on, maybe there's going to be signal jamming going on within these robots themselves. Maybe that's what they'll use to blame uh, the robots going off on a killing spree. Finally, Stuart Russell says this. It's a very long paper. You should read the entire article. But here's the conclusion that I think you should take from this. He says, to do nothing is a vote in favor of continued development and deployment. It's not enough for us to just look at this and see what's wrong with it. He also says, in my view, overriding concern should be the probable endpoint of this technological trajectory. We've been pointing out this trajectory for a very long time. And of course, the elite have been pointing it out for a very long time as well. Zbigniew Brzezinski in the book that he wrote, Between Two Ages, 45 years ago, the book that brought him to the attention, presumably, of David Rockefeller, because it was just in three years that David Rockefeller created the Trilateral Commission, put Zbigniew Brzezinski in charge of it. Zbigniew Brzezinski talked about the new technotronic era, where there would be constant surveillance of the population and constant control of that population by the government, by an elite few. That's his words, essentially. We need to understand what this trajectory is. We need to understand what is really behind mastering the human domain as we see special forces being given biometric ana analysis weapons to use in the field, as we see them mapping everything about you 
and your movements, who you know, and your religious, political, and social uh, dimensions onto a geographical map. This is taking everything down to the most minute control. But don't worry. All of these things are just exercises. They're for your safety. They're for emergencies. They're for use in foreign countries only. You know, just like the NSA and the CIA. They were never going to be used here domestically in America, yet they have been doing that for over 40 years. They've been operating illegally outside of their charter, outside of the Constitution, violating the Constitution continually in the United States, and we still have presidential candidates who pretend that's not going on. So they offer us something like this. We have yet another DARPA challenge that's coming up with robots, and this is being put out on popular science, the people that always have just a gee whiz attitude, no matter how sinister the technology. Meet Chimp, a disaster response robot with four-limb drive. If you believe that this robot here, or that any of these robots, are really about helping people simply in an emergency situation. Of course, they could be used to help in a situation like Fukushima Daiichi. They could be used instead of humans to go in and manipulate things. That's the justification they're using for it. But if you think that's the key mission of DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects, if you think that's what they're about, then you're, not, you're nothing but a chump when it comes to things like this robot. So they're going to have yet another one of these uh, contests. They had one just last year. And of course, Google bought all of the most promising robots from that competition, trying to get a monopoly. And it looks like they're pretty much, uh, they're getting very close to having a monopoly of the most promising technology at this point in time. Stay with us when we come back. We're going to talk about something that sounds like it's straight out of the Planet of the Apes. It's not just about treating them as humans. It's also about releasing a pandemic. What's going on when the CDC and the Pentagon weaponizes bacteria and then time after time releases it, accidentally, of course, into the environment. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Now, the Center for Disease Control, as well as the Department of Defense, are telling us that they are working on ways to protect us from bioterrorism. In order to do that, they work with very dangerous diseases and they weaponize them. What does it mean when they weaponize these things? They refer to it as gain of function. What they do is they make these things easier to transmit and harder to kill. How does that protect us? Very good question, especially when we look at the carelessness and the sloppy work that's been happening, especially within just the last year, the many, many outbreaks. And we're going to go over those in just a moment. But now we've had, just yesterday, a live anthrax uh, incident. It was accidentally shipped throughout the United States and to South Korea. Four lab workers in the United States and up to 22 overseas have been put in post-exposure treatment after the U.S. military inadvertently shipped live anthrax samples via Federal Express. You know, when you absolutely positively have to get the pandemic there the next day. They say they thought these shipments were dead and they were shipped under less rigorous conditions, obviously. Leanne McAdoo has more information about that. The Pentagon admits it accidentally sent a shipment of live anthrax to as many as nine laboratories in the U.S. as well as a lab overseas. A CDC investigation of this mistake is underway, and at the time there is no known risk to the general public. The anthrax samples were shipped from an Army facility in Utah to government and commercial labs in Texas, Maryland, Wisconsin, Delaware, New Jersey, Tennessee, New York, California, and Virginia. The labs were working as part of a Pentagon effort to develop a new diagnostic test to identify biological threats in the environment. Dead or inactivated agents were expected, but one lab reports being able to grow live Bacillus anthraxis. The safety failure comes on the heels of increased scrutiny of bioterror agents and their oversight around the country. Last June, more than 80 people may have been exposed to live anthrax when a CDC lab sent it by a mistake. Remember that it was just last July that we had the head of, they said, a troubled CDC anthrax lab resign. There was a leak at the time. They said an embarrassing and serious safety incidents at the Centers for Disease Control. The people who are at the lead in all of this, they said it resulted in the resignation of a top lab official in Atlanta. This was part of the CDC's bioterrorism rapid response. I guess we need to ask... Uh, <laughs> Who is the bioterrorist here? The person, Michael Farrell, 
was reassigned to other duties last month in the wake of his team's mishandling of live anthrax, same as just happened this week, and potential exposure of dozens of agency employees to a particularly deadly strain of the bacteria, although none has shown signs of infection. Now, this is what one of the two biosafety experts who was asked to testify at a House Oversight Committee hearing said. Sean Hoffman said, he's a scapegoat and everybody knows that. He said, Mike had just as much to do with this incident as the people all of the way at the top. And I would say that in light of the continued uh, problems that we've seen at the CDC and elsewhere, that has been proven to be true. This has continued in spite of the fact that he was fired. He was simply a scapegoat. In an article uh, from USA Today the very next month, Allison Young pointed out that hundreds of bioterrorism labs mishaps are cloaked in secrecy. She said more than 1,100 laboratory incidents involving potential bioterror germs were reported to federal regulators during 2008 through 2012. That's not even up to date. That's not even including the anthrax incident uh, in July, the month earlier, and the one that just happened, of course, this uh, week. This was back in uh, last August. She says details of what happened are cloaked in secrecy. Well, of course they are, because this is something that the Department of Defense and the CDC is doing to supposedly protect us from bioterrorism. See, we have to be concerned about that, so we take very deadly bacteria, in many cases, not even indigenous to the United States, bring them here into our labs. We make them harder to kill. We make them easier to transmit. We saw a pushback against this, not in the media so much as we saw in the Senate and uh, the Congress. And we had a hearing last fall. They stopped uh, funding new projects, they said, new gain-of-function projects. Nevertheless, that's not a moratorium. They are still funding the ones that they had already okayed. So that was the situation in the fall. Then we learned just a month or two after that that there was a leak at the Primate Center. The Tulane National Primate Research Center near New Orleans became the focus of both federal and state investigations after tests in December showed two rhesus macaw monkeys were not part of any experiments, nevertheless were sickened by a strain of bioterror bacteria that was being studied in a biosafety level three lab elsewhere on the 500-acre campus. Now, this is what happened. This is a bacteria called Burkholderia pseudomalii. It's not indigenous to the United States. They were working with it, weaponizing this, and somehow it got out of their biosafety level three lab. It got into the monkeys that were just roaming free on this 500-acre facility. It's something that is very troubling because once this gets into the soil, it can take a very long time to appear and it can, can spread and continue to infect animals everywhere. They were concerned about how this had happened, and they still have not found how this got out of the lab. There's still no explanations to it. They were concerned that there were uh, workers that were exposed there, investigators that were exposed there. They had uh, one FDA official that uh, showed signs of having this bacteria. They said, uh, well, she's investigated this before, so I'm sure that's where she got this exposure. They also said, don't be surprised if this does show up in the soil because, you know, it's, it's probably there. Nevertheless, the CDC pushed back and said, no, this has never been in the United States. If it shows up there, it's going to be because of their sloppy handling. This is what we need to be concerned about. In case after case, we see that the government that tells us that it's going to protect us is our greatest danger. Creating threats that don't exist, whether it's al-Qaeda and ISIS, and uh, things that are real threats to our life, just like this bacteria. They create these threats, and then they go off to fight them. They cause us to have to pay for them in terms of money and in terms of our lives. We need to shut down these gain-of-function experiments. We need to stop doing this. They have shown that they cannot reliably and safely handle this, and they need to explain why we really need to have such an aggressive bioweapon program in the first place. Now, stay with us. Right after the break, we're going to be talking to Wolfgang Halbig. He's trying to get answers about something else, Sandy Hook. He worked for 19 months to try to get information. He was stonewalled. He was threatened. He finally got a FOIA hearing. So we're going to talk to him about that FOIA hearing he had a couple of weeks ago and one that's coming up this next week. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Now, if you remember, in the aftermath of the Sandy Hook shooting, we immediately got a full court press for gun control. At the same time, there were many questions that many of us were asking, anomalies that we saw in what was being given to us as the official story. Wolfgang Halbig is someone who was a state trooper as well as a principal of a school. 
He combined those two experiences to become a school security consultant. He's not someone who has ever been involved in any other investigations like 9-11 or anything like that. He was someone who was a school security consultant looking at school shootings. He's investigated many school shootings. He's never had this kind of resistance, not only resistance, not only stonewalling, but outright intimidation. He's gotten very angry about this. He has been on this like a bulldog. And now after 19 months, at the end of April, he was able to finally get his first FOIA hearing. We're going to talk to him live after this interview. But Dan Badandi went to the first FOIA hearing and talked to Wolfgang Halbig after that. Dan Badandi, Infowars.com. We're in Hartford, Connecticut with Wolfgang Halbig. How are you doing, sir? Good. Thanks for coming all the way up here and uh, taking a look at what's happening today. It is. You know what? That is the classic work in Connecticut. It's unbelievable how they play with the law. They manipulate it. They play with it. Mm -hmm. And people laugh about it. These witnesses from Connecticut, they, they think it's funny. I don't think it's funny. That's a filthy, deplorable looking school. It's a toxic waste dump. And they ought to be ashamed of themselves. I've seen them all with smiles, all wasting time purposely, so, you know, it gets, us, gets you out of here quick. Oh, absolutely. They're dragging it. They got the heat turned up in here. Everything they can do to make it uncomfortable. But you know what? I've got a good attorney. I love Kay Wilson. She's not afraid to ask questions. And uh, we'll be back. And they're going to have to answer, especially the one about Connecticut State Trooper. Can you imagine? you got a state helicopter that doesn't have audio tapes. Or rec what kind of state troopers are these? Yeah, I, kind of, I kind of found it hard to believe that the helicopter was not communicating with the officers on the ground. I mean, that was like, wow. Well, you know what's really interesting? We actually have the flight law. Can you imagine the police chief says, oh, I don't know. I've never seen anything like that. That is the Connecticut State, state Police official flight log. And you know what it re reads? To assist the Newtown Police Department in searching for suspects in the woods. Now, let me think what, how that works. How did a helicopter know they needed somebody? Somebody had to call them. And they lied like a dog. It's under oath. Chief Kehoe, do you know whether or not there are any transcripts of communications on for December 14, 2012 from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. between the Newtown Police Department and the Connecticut State Police Trooper 1 helicopter? To best my out, there are no communications. No communications? That's correct. It's a game changer for America, and they ought to see it for what it is. They're playing silly games. They got attorneys who are hiding behind the truth, manipulating data. And this is the one that y'all hear today, the town. Well, you know what? They painted it with a broad brush. The town covers everybody. It covers the school board, covers the police department. And all they have to do is say, the town doesn't have it. And you're supposed to be happy about it. I'm looking for a custodian of records. The town is not the custodian of records, even though he writes that in there. Do you have any reason to believe that I was not responding on behalf of the Board of Education, the Town of Newtown, and the Newtown Police Department? I do not believe. All right. I want the answers from the school board. I want the answers from the police department. I don't give a damn about the town. But see, that's what they're doing. They're manipulating the law. Are you aware of any emails that may have come from school principal Don Hoxbrung or her assistant school principal for the period of May 1st, 2012 through December 13th, 2012 to the facilities department? Yes. And um, did you, have you reviewed those emails? I, I don't quite understand the question. Have you looked at them? Have you read them? Of course. Okay, so they exist. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I mean, Frank can't help I, you with that. If, I, I, I if would, you received think, them and you read them, then I, they must exist. I would exist. think that they must exist, yes. You testified that you did not receive a copy of the sign-on log referred to on a traffic sign posted outside the Newtown Sandy Hook Elementary School on December 14, 2012, right? And the town responded that it does not have that document, right? Is that what it says? Yeah, but you have nothing. You don't have any documents. I mean, Isn't what, that what, what, sir, answer my question. Isn't that what it says? The town does not have responsive documents. Absolutely, but you have documents from nobody. And you just don't believe that, correct? I don't believe you. I don't trust you. <laughs> <laughs> we 
The dash cam videos, I actually got the video. I actually, I got the video of Seabrook's dash cam. It actually has timestamp. They refused to give it to me. They have it, and yet they refused, they altered, I think they tampered and altered the documents. That's a crime. Law enforcement can't do that. And it's unbelievable. And now, again, they're wasting time, so they now wait, they want to prolong this. Is that correct? Absolutely. Again, they're going to drag it out. They're going to find ways to manipulate it, you know, and I guess we just have to do a better job. You know, uh, Kay does a great job. I've got to, I tell you what, I'm so, I bless God that I found her, you know, because she is not afraid to ask questions. Just remind you, you're under oath, but I'd like to ask you whether or not you know whether or not those dash cam recordings contain a date signature and a time stamp as well as a listing of the police car or um, unit and the officer. Could you repeat the question please? Do the do the dash cam videos typically contain a date stamp, a time, a unit or an officer's name in the video? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us why there was no date stamp or time on the video shown to Mr. Helbig yesterday by your executive secretary? <coughs> what you reviewed yesterday was a copy. The best we could do to copy our in-car camera system. Two pages medium that could be viewed uh, by, um, by you, and that was our best attempt to copy. How did, so if the originals had date and time stamps on them, how did those date and time stamps fall off of the copies which were given to us for viewing yesterday? I'm not sure they did. Did you review the... No, they're embedded in, in that that uh, copy of the um, video reviewed yesterday. And how, how do you know that? Because I, I viewed it. And did you actually see them appear on the screen, yes. superimposed on the video? Yes. Okay, so you did review them prior to allowing us to view them yesterday? Yes. And it's your testimony that there were date and time stamps on them at the time that you reviewed them? Yes. I'm doing this for America. I'm doing this for every parent, every grandparent. You know, we should have rights to ask questions, but not just that. We ought to be able to get the truth. We ought to be able to walk into an office and say, I'd like to see these documents. What are they hiding? This is, this is serious stuff. Serious. Because what, who else wants a Sandy Hook and Air community? Nobody. We, it's got to stop. It's got to stop here, and it's got to stop now. Absolutely, and uh, I want to thank you for your time, Wolf, and uh, well, I want to thank you from a patriot to a patriot uh, for your great and hard work. Thank you. And folks, again, uh, I mean, you ask the real questions, you get ignored completely. It's, it's unreal, it really is. Truth is definitely stranger than fiction. And this is Dan Bedanti for Infowars.com. Yeah. What does this have to do with documents? Well, because, well, we have never received those inspection reports, although they are the subject of this appeal. Now, in the last segment, you saw the interview that Dan Bedondi did with Wolfgang Halbig at the first FOIA hearing, a hearing that took 19 months to get, a lot of stonewalling, a lot of intimidation. Joining us now is Wolfgang Halbig. Thank you for joining us, Wolfgang. Before we get into what you learned at the FOIA hearing, give the viewers an idea of what it took to even get to the point where they would answer questions from you, because it wasn't the sort of thing where you just said, uh, I'd like to get this information, and they said, sure, here it is. It was uh, pretty much a struggle, wasn't it? Absolutely, and I mean, it's been 19 months to finally get to Hartford, Connecticut, mm. and have a chance to tell your side of the story and have them show cause as to why they're intentionally refusing to release documents under the Connecticut FOIA request. You know, if I were not a national school safety consultant, I mean, I get hired by superintendents and school board members to come into their school districts and help them design safe school plans. And I wouldn't be asking these questions. And for them to intentionally 
intentionally violate their own Connecticut FOIA laws. I mean, they're refusing, and these are school board policies that they're even refusing to respond to. Yes. So for 19 months, you've been trying to get this. They stonewalled you. They threatened you. But now you finally get to the FOIA hearing. Tell us what you discovered at this first FOIA hearing, because there's another one that's coming up on June 3rd. But tell us what you learned on this particular one. Well, what's really, I, I need to let you know, I wouldn't be there had it not been for people from all over the country who believed in me and my mission. And they need to know that when they seen me in that chair at the FOIA hearing, if it weren't for them, I would not be there. And, and David, I got to tell you, I've never, ever, after we issued subpoenas for people to be our witnesses, to show up and verify that those documents exist, the attorney for the school board, the city of Newtown, and the Newtown Police Department, they told our witnesses not to show up. Now, when have wow. you ever heard of that? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty arrogant. That's pretty arrogant. That is arrogant. Amazing. It's flagrant. It's misuse of his office. He's an officer of the court. How does he tell my witnesses not to show up for this hearing? And you know what? They didn't show up. Wow, that's amazing. So is that why you're having the uh, second FOIA hearing, so that you can get to these witnesses who did not show up? Well, we did have a couple show up, and that's what makes it even more difficult. Why did they allow the police chief to show up? Why did they allow the director of facilities show up, but then cancel the other three, which I found extremely important, especially to the FOIA request? Now, one of the things that you were able to get was a video showing uh, things that happened at the school. But one of the things that was interesting was that it had a missing timestamp. The reason they put that timestamp on, of course, is so people know that the footage is not edited. Nevertheless, there was a missing timestamp. Tell us about that. Well, you know, I've been asking for this for over a year. I requested from the Newtown Police Department, the dash cam videos of Lieutenant Cinco, Lieutenant Seabrook. Those are the two that I was really concerned about. And, and David, when they stuck us in that little room at the Newtown Police Department, they gave me a DVD. They took off the date, the timestamp, and the real time. I mean, can you imagine? You don't alter and tamper with evidence. Yeah, yeah. These right. are public records. You can't, you can't tamper with it. And then when we asked the police chief at the hearing under oath, he said that when he watched those dash cam videos, the date and timestamps were there. You could see it. So the question begins: Who has the authority to tell someone to remove and alter and tamper with those official records? Absolutely, and of course. Uh, that really begs the question, are these edited? Because that would be the only reason I could think of that they would want to remove the timestamps. Well, I, I totally agree with you. I think this thing needs to be investigated by Congress. I mean, th David, there are so many lies by Connecticut state troopers, and now we've got the dash cam footages that are altered and tampered with. And what's the reason for it? See, yeah. this is what this is why I think people need to wake up. They need to get angry. They need, I mean, they need to get angry. They need to be subscribers to your shows. They need to get involved. I'm gonna tell you something. We caught two people at that first hearing committing perjury. David, listen to this word. The police chief, Mike Kehoe, committed perjury under oath on that first hearing. The director of facilities, I can tell you this. Being a former cop, they committed perjury, and I cannot wait to go back June the 3rd to finish them off. What did they do when you say they committed perjury? Tell us about well, that. Well, we're going to file perjury charges because think about this. When, when a police chief receives their first 911 call, okay, I don't know if people listened to it, they remember it. It was a woman saying shots fired inside the school. Now, I asked the police chief, is this call for service a legal document? I showed him a document. Is this a legal official police document? He said, yes. I showed him a copy of the incident log. Is this an official police log? Is this official? Is the truth, the whole truth? He said, yes, it is. David, they never even showed shots fired inside the school. The hmm. first call they listed as an unwanted person and they dispatched 22 police cars to an unwanted person call. That is just an outright lie and nowhere, I'm gonna say this again, nowhere in that police report, both of them, will you ever see shots fired inside the school. Why? He's committing perjury.
That's amazing. Now, is that the same log that you, uh, there was also a check-in log, or is that a different log that you can That's see? That's a completely different yeah. log. That, Tell us about that. Well, you know, everybody has seen this Gene Rosen standing out there being, photo being photographed by the national news media. Well, behind him is this huge traffic sign. It says, everyone must sign in. Well, you know, I've been asking this for your question, who's everyone? I mean, think about it. What if you don't sign? Are there consequences if you don't sign in? I mean, it says everyone must sign in. So that's a directive, I believe. And if you don't follow those directives, are you going to be arrested? And so I requested under the FOIA laws a copy of the sign-in log. And for 19 months, David, I have yet to get it. So they won't give you a copy of the sign-in log, which we see a, a video showing that that's mandatory. When you look at the 9-11 log, there's nothing about shots fired. Uh, it's amazing, Wolfgang. I mean, if they're telling people the whole purpose of government and the whole purpose of the police, of course, is to protect us, to make us safe. That's your purpose as well as a school security consultant. If they're not going to tell people what happened there, they've got a very different agenda. And it's amazing to me that they would let this go for, that they would push this for 19 months and, and get to this point. Tell us some of the other things that you found in the FOIA request. Well, the same hearing. thing. When I had to connect, when I had the police chief, Mike Kehoe under oath, I asked him a question. Who contacted the Connecticut State Trooper 1? You know, because I had a copy of their flight log. And he stated under oath, David, that they never, never, ever had any communication, he or his department, with the state trooper. But when you read the flight log from the pilot, uh, his name is McLean, Sergeant McLean. He states that the reason that they were on this mission is to assist the Newtown Police Department in searching for suspects in the woods. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me what that would mean if you were to read that. And, of course, we saw some video of some people that were running through the woods, and they, they pulled them back and that as well. But, but you don't see it on the other side. So you've got one log that says it, another one that, uh, that doesn't have that information recorded in it. Absolutely. They're just flat out lying, making it up. And then in the incident log, you have an officer, Seabrook, 95. He's actually writing a speeding ticket at 10.15 a.m. on the official incident police log. But yet, when you read the police statement at 9.40, he's actually at the Sandy Hook Elementary School. How can he be in two places when the incident log is actually the official police law, which is sworn by Mike Kehoe. Wow. Wow. Tell us about the janitor. There's uh, some things that you found out about the janitor as well. Well, it's the same thing with the janitors. You know, uh, they are supposed to be the ones that initiate, you know, the, uh, the work orders. And I cannot tell you, when you see these work orders, they're generated in September and October of 2012. And you look at it and it makes sense. But you know when they completed the assignment on um, July, May, June, July of 2013, why would you come into Sandy Hook and fix schools on projects that are broken when you know you're going to demolish the school? Hmm. Why would you waste taxpayer money fixing a school that's about to be torn down? Exactly. Tell us about the uh, mold as well on the outside. Oh, Your question about cool. the mold. David, that school, by far, if you look at the member of the witness, Barbara Sibley and Rob Sibley, who were on Katie Curry, now they talk about standing at the front entrance of the school. We have pictures that show the most filthiest, most deplorable looking school. It is actually a toxic waste dump, and it's not based on what I say, it's what's in the newspaper. Highest level of lead paint, highest level of asbestos, insulation, ceiling tile, floor tile. It has the highest level of PCP. The groundwater is contaminated around the school. And yet we have parents who would allow their children to attend that type of a school? I don't believe so. And if they did, then those parents are negligent for putting their children at risk, David. Is there anything else you want to tell us about this particular FOIA hearing before we talk about the, the one that's coming up? No, I just think we made, uh, you know, I had to fire my attorney. I, I gave him $10,000 to get me to the first hearing. I fired him a month before the hearing because I think he's in collusion with the other attorney. I think these people are working against me. So I hired a new attorney. I had her for 24 days when she had to go in front of the FOIA commission. 
And, and David, she did a great job. And I think now we know how the game is played. I think now we have the evidence we can submit that we weren't allowed to submit to begin with because the other attorney objective. Now we know how they play the game and we're gonna play it better. And the other thing I wanna share with you, the first time I was up there here for the first hearing, we actually called Governor Dan Malloy telling the biggest lie that a governor could ever talk about Sandy Hook. If you remember, on the day of the shooting, he had his national press conference, and he started out by saying this. This is really important. This is a governor now. He says that the lieutenant governor and I were spoken to that something like this might happen in our state. I went to the governor's office. I had a video camera, audio, and I recorded him. I said, Governor, who told you that? He said, he looked at me right in the eyes. He said, I never said that. I said, Governor, you look good on TV. Who told you, the Lieutenant Governor, that something like this might happen in your state? I want to know who the person is. He said, I never, ever said that. Now, this is a man on national television, and you guys in your studio could probably run the clip. He said it, and he's just an outright liar. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, Tell people how they can support you, because as you mentioned at the beginning of the uh, interview, you can't do this without financial support. It costs legal fees to do this. This has been a long, ongoing struggle, 19 months. Tell people how they can support this investigation, how they can support you in the next FOIA hearing. Well, David, I, I, I'm begging them to trust me on this, because this is a game changer for America. Please go to www.sandyhookjustice.com. If you ever, ever believe in America, and you love your country, let me tell you, we got them in the box. They're committing perjury left and right, and when we go back, it's going to get uglier. I'm asking you, find 10 friends. Donate whatever you can. If you can't afford it, don't do it. But I can't do it without paying the legal bills. And we've got two attorneys, and I need help now or more, or it's going to end June the 3rd. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, you have living expenses on your own as well. I mean, you can't just do no, this. I don't, a... no, no, no. I don't, I don't take any money for myself. This is only okay. for legal bills, travel. No, no. This is not about Wolfgang. Okay. This is well, simply good. about the legal bills. Well, my hat off to you, Wolfgang, because I know that you do have personal expenses as well. You need to get something out there where people can help you with your personal expenses as well. But tell us now, of course, this that you just gave is for people who want to contribute to the legal expenses for this FOIA hearing. You've got another one coming up June 3rd. Give us an idea of uh, what's going to happen with that and where people can watch that as it's happening live. Well, again, we're gonna to try to have all type of video cameras. We're gonna live stream it if we can. We're gonna do everything we can. It's a public uh, meeting, it's open to anyone. And what we're, we've subpoenaed the pilot from Connecticut State Trooper One. Remember what we said earlier about the mission? I'm actually gonna, I, I actually, uh, uh, subpoena the pilot for his testimony. Then I've got the head custodian, Kevin Ancelotti, and then I've got the principal from uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School, the new one. We want to know where those 26 kids are that sang at the Super Bowl on February the 3rd, 2013. Do you know we can't find them anywhere? Hmm. Now, where did they go? They sang in front of 100 million people, and nobody knows where these 26 children went to. It's really amazing. And of course, you're not allowed to ask any questions. Uh, when we asked questions, we actually had uh, one of these people that uh, said that they had a child who died there put a false uh, uh, lay, uh, put a false charge against us on YouTube saying that we had uh, violated copyright of Fox News that didn't even involve anything with, with Fox News. This is a very, very strange case. There's a lot of anomalies. We've seen a lot of contradictions. And of course, Wolfgang, we see this in many different areas. Whenever the government is so concerned about covering things up, when they stonewall everything, when you get any answers from them, it's a contradiction of what you got before. We know that there's something under the surface. So I really appreciate you staying on this like a bulldog. This is a very important issue. We see this over and over again. Something has to change in our government. Over and over again, we see these types of shootings, or whether it's an assassination, or whether it's a so-called terrorist attack, we get these kind of contradictory uh, data from the government because they are covering something up. And we really hope that you can get to the bottom of this. Well, I thank you and Rob and Alex for being there with us. Otherwise, the message would never get out. The national news media will not touch this. Oh, and no. I can promise no. you this, 
they will be embarrassed one day because I think the government used the national news media to exploit and hurt millions of innocent Americans. I mean, I think they intentionally hurt people. And I think that's terrorism. That's treason. I think you're a good example of how when somebody actually does investigative work, they are dismissed by the government, by the media that covers for the government as a conspiracy theorist. We're not allowed to question authority. We're not even allowed to see the official reports anymore. It's gotten to that point. Anybody that does any investigation is immediately denounced as paranoid, as a conspiracy theorist. And yet, we are never allowed to verify their conspiracy theories. That's the key, is that they're coming up with a story. We just want to see verification for the official story. When they shut us down, when we catch them in lies, that's when we know that there's something up. Thank you so much for joining us, Wolfgang Halbig. And give us that uh, website one more time. It's www.sandyhookjustice.com. Www and David, they can call me, 352-729-2559. Talk to me if you have questions. Appreciate that. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. Thank you for what Thank you're you, doing. Sir. And again, to reiterate, Wolfgang has investigated many school shootings. He investigated Columbine. He's never seen this kind of stonewalling, this kind of lying and intimidation before. So the question is, what is underneath all of this? So we hope that you will support him in his efforts. We hope you'll support us. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll be able to see the news as it comes up. If you want to get it the night before, as it's being broadcast on the nightly news, please become a subscriber. You can support our operation financially, as well as make available the news broadcast to 20 of your friends. And all of Alex Jones's documentaries are available to subscribers as well. Again, join us tomorrow at 7 Central. Dave. My mind is going. I can feel it.